George Cameron Mackenzie Horn was born in the 30s in Edinburgh and went to the Royal Academy. He then went into to do his national service and they formed a regiment for him and he joined the Cameroonian Rifles. <laughs> he went... So, um, he still attends St. Leonard's in the Fields Church because he fell out of the old school. He fell out of the church. <laughs> 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 no, that seems very hard. Tonight, that is the, 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 the absent Mr. Horn. We can raise a glass if anyone has a glass to absent friends. Absent friends. Come on. Come that too. Good show. Sure. Um, tonight we have contributions from five of us, which is uh, fair average, because if everyone was asked to do it, nothing changes. Uh, Peter, since you have been most recently on, uh, would you care to present us with your uh, offering. When I was putting together uh, just a, a very quick poem, just a, just a few minutes, I realised that some of our guests wouldn't have any idea whatsoever what I was talking about. Now, so I thought myself, well, I better, better, before I do anything, I better explain what the poem is about. A lot of us here would, would know about the, the old song about uh, the 12 days of Christmas <coughs> when my true love sent to me all sorts of strange and exotic um, presents. For example, a tree with a bird in it, two pigeons, three French hens, four calling birds, gold rings, five gold rings, six geese laying eggs, seven swans swimming, eight maids are milking, nine ladies dancing, ten lords leaping, leather pipers piping, and twelve drummers drumming. Now this is quite an eccentric lot of presency, you, you would have to agree. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is the response from the individual who got these presents. And I'm calling it the 13th day of Christmas. <coughs> what you have to do is imagine that he's on the telephone and his lover is saying, well, what do you think? And he's saying, yeah, well, I suppose I should be grateful. You've obviously gone to a lot of trouble and a lot of expense. <laughs> but maybe you're just off your head. Yes, yes, yes. I like the birds. They were small and they were fun. 
if somewhat messy. And the hens are now roosting in my bed and in my wardrobe. It's hard to sleep with all the pigeons cooing, let alone the cackling of those geese's laying eggs. The eggs which are now all over my set scene, mostly broken and a really smelly heap. Now, why should I mind? No, I don't mind at all. Uh, I can't get any peace anywhere. The lounge is full of drummers thumping their uh, tom-toms and sprawling lords tired out from a night of leaping. <laughs> the kitchen. The kitchen is crammed with cows and girls milking. And a million stink bombs, it seems, feels like. And I have enough sour milk to last me a whole year. The pipers, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about the pipers. I paid them and off they went. <laughs> but I can't get rid of these young ladies. They won't stop dancing. And they won't turn the music down. And they're always in the bathroom, squealing as they spit across the flooded floor. No, 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 I don't need a plumber. It's for the swans. You know, what else can I paddle in? Where can they swim? I think they are going mad. Just like me, I was in the bathroom washing my hands and I ate the soap and one of them swallowed all the gold ring. So thank you dear for nothing. <laughs> Goodbye, <laughs> love. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Hugh, yeah. would you be good enough to um, see something? <laughs> see something. Well done. Thank you very much, Jim. Well, uh, it's a great pity that uh, Cameron can't be with us tonight because I've gone through a whole load of uh, wee stories and anecdotes that I wanted to tell you. Maisie said, You can't say that, you can't say that. But it's a pity Cameron couldn't be with us tonight. It's really all work to just tease him a wee bit. But anyway, um, tonight, I would like to share with you a poem that, I, you know, it's a very personal poem that uh, has been written by a lady called <coughs> Helen Maria Williams. And uh, it's, it really be, it's a poem that sort of looks back and looks forward and addresses some of the things about Christmas. And it, it's, uh, it gives a nod to John Keats. So it's, uh, it's not a nod to John Keats, but a nod, a nod to John Keats. Now, John Keats, I remember I first encountered him when I was at George Heriot's and uh, our English teacher uh, took us in one day and he said, boys, today we are going to learn about Keats. And I said, sir, sir, what is a Keat? <laughs> Mackenzie, come out here and take the, take the belt. So I thought it was a really good joke then. I still think it's quite abusive. But anyway, uh, this point tonight is... To Mrs. K on her sending me an English Christmas plum cake at Paris. So it's by Helen Maria Williams. What crowding thoughts are round me wake? What marvels in a Christmas cake? I say what say strange enchantment dealt wells enclosed within its odorous cells. There is no small magician bound, encrusted in the snowy round. For magic surely lurks in this, a cake that tells of vanished bliss. A cake that conjures up to view the early scenes when life was new. When memories knew, no sorrows pass, and hope believe in joys that last. Mysterious cake whose folds contain life's calendar of bliss and pain that speaks of friends forever flying and wakes the tears I love to shed. Oft shall I breathe her cherished name for those whose fair hand the offering came. For she recalls the artless smile of nymphs that decked my native island. Of beauty that we love to trace, 
alive with tender, modest grace. For those who while abroad they roam, retain each charm that gladdens home. And those whose dear friendships can impart a Christmas banquet for the heart. enough to make you poke, and a couple of jaggy branches climbed up the back of my frock. And all these legs around me, I can't get my sleep, uh, and enough, and there's that yearly visit from Santa, big crack creep. On Christmas Day, I'm stuck up here, well you're all wiring in. And it's nobody says, hey, you up there, could you go a slug of gin? It's no job being a fairy, it's a job beyond belief. You've got to get through, go round the wains, be in <laughs> bed and look, lift their rotten teeth. <coughs> but all the jobs a fairy gets, and I've mentioned only some, the very worst is sitting up a tree with pine needles up your bum. <laughs> <laughs> when all the fairies meet again by the light of the silvery moon, you can tell the Christmas fairies they're the ones that carry set to. <laughs> <laughs> the Christmas trees are bonny sicht as the firelight softly flickers. But think of me, I'm stuck up here with needles in my knickers. <laughs> so soon as Christmas time comes right back, I'll stop being so full of cheer and I'll go back to Fairyland and I'll see you all next year. <laughs>
Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, I haven't prepared anything, so this is all, you know, off the cuff, because I'm supposed to be able to do this. I used to be quite a good speaker a long, long time ago. In fact, I used to enter competitions, and I entered a competition, and I was doing really well, <laughs> until that man over there <laughs> beat me. <laughs> Beat me into second place. I never, I, I never raise it. I never, I never <laughs> tell anybody about it. No, I'm never. <coughs> no. <laughs> Actually, what I, 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 I'm supposedly the national president, and I've, I've talked to some people tonight and asked them why they joined. And there's a lovely lady over here who teaches English as a foreign language. Somebody from business, because they have to do business presentations. They're all sensible reasons. I joined for a radically different reason. I joined because at school I was called the school boats. And I had to have a thing on my head, and I was put in the corner because I have a, a disability. You can't see it. I don't stagger unless I'm drunk. Uh, but I'm a dyslexic. I'm a massive dyslexic, and I don't read and write very well. But back in the 60s, they didn't believe in dyslexia. You were just dick. <laughs> and I was regularly parading in front of the school. Do not be like this boy. He is stupid. And, I would, and this went on until I was about 14. My parents brought me into a private school and it got worse. <laughs> because, you know, his parents have money, but he is still stupid. <laughs> um, but then at 14, my father took me to an association called Toastmasters. And I met a group of people who weren't reading, who weren't writing, but they were communicating. And I thought, I can do that. Because I can talk behind their go. Don't, not a problem. And I've been in ASC since it started back in 71. And I love it because you don't have to read, you don't have to write. And people still call me stupid, but for very different reasons now. <laughs> but when I was at school, I heard somebody saying about how they were uh, talking about their, their education. I too made jokes to teachers. We had an English liter literature teacher, Mrs. Kersoff. And we were doing the play Macbeth. I don't know if you know it. Uh, but there is a scene where the, it's called the porter's scene. And it begins, who is this knocking at the gates of hell? And the porter gives this long speech. And I thought it was wonderful. And I waited for that part of the play. And we got to it, and Mrs. Kersop said, oh, we'll just pass this over. It was only put there by Shakespeare for the actors to change. Move on. And I stood up and said, excuse me, Mrs. Kersop. You are a mere BA in English. He was the greatest bard our country's ever known. Get out, Scott! So uh, that was it. <laughs> I came up to Scotland and I discovered a gentleman here was saying he was a bit Glaswegian. I got up here and I discovered it was a different language. When I first arrived, I come from the northeast of England, I'm a Geordie. I know I don't sound it, because when I get nervous, I sound Welsh. <laughs> my grandma was Welsh. But I came up here, and we have a beer in the northeast of England, if anyone's ever drunk there, it's called McEwen's Best Scotch. And I went into Jamie's bar, and I walked up to the bar and said, uh, can I get a pint of scotch, mate? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be 16 quid. <laughs> beer was one pound and threepence. I said, what, what, what's this? He said, you're a Geordie, aren't you? I said, yeah, he said, I've been waiting to do one of you buggers. <laughs> <laughs> I also learned when we had children, my eldest boy went to school, and he came home one day, and you know how fathers have to know everything. He got in the car and he said, Dad, I need guppies. Right. Yeah. How many do you need? Well, two. Right. Um, and what do you use them for? He said, you put them on your feet for gym. I said, oh, God, you mean rubbers. And my six-year-old went red and said, no, I don't want rubbers. No, I want gutters for my feet. So we all have differences in language, and we can all get round them. Speakers Club, though, as tonight shows, is a friendly group. I mentioned to a couple of people when I first arrived here, this club was held in great esteem by my father, because he came to this club when it was Toastmasters, to a dinner. And the Perth men were, how could I describe it, rather generous with alcohol. And my father 
was very willing to accept. <laughs> and he got bloody drunk. And they all took him back to his hotel. Somewhere in Perth, there was a hotel with a big astronaut of stairs. And all the members, it seemed, stood in a half circle and aimed my father for the door. And he went up <laughs> and went down. <laughs> so, aimed him. And he said it took him 15 minutes to get to the door. But the Perth Speakers Club, the Toastmasters, had organised for the night porter to sort him out, take him, put him to bed, and see that he was on the train the next morning. He held Perth in high esteem. And apart from Ewan, I also hold Perth in high esteem. <laughs> and I thank you for this delightful evening. Yeah. Oh, Joe, a wee bit, wee bit different. Uh, would you be song with communal singing, no less. Okay. Uh, being Christmas, I thought I'd actually lighten the tone. Um, um, I was trying to think of something that you could actually sing along with. You know, uh, there was one that kind of occurred to me. The chorus went, "They grabbed his head and severed it, and then ripped out his tongue. It wriggled like a jelly deal on the ground where it was flung. They beat his brains to a throbbing mush and slashed his guts asunder." and cut his heart out with a duck, and he died. No <laughs> bloody wonder. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, I thought that was just a wee bit intense, you know, <laughs> maybe before the watershed. So, we decided to go with this one, okay? We decided to go with this one. Communal singing, I'll give you a shout and that kind of stuff, but it's quite easy for you to pick up, okay? But here we go. A man came riding out the west one wild and stormy day. He was quiet, lean and hungry, his eyes were smoky grey. He was laid across the herd hills, but his shooters, they were big. The terror of the healing glens. That was the poor tree kid. He did um ho, he did um hey. The shooter that come from the sky. His sidekick was an older man, but all he was mean. He was called the Midnight Ploughboy and he came to Aberdeen. He had 27 notches on his crummock, so they say, and he killed a million Indians way up in Stornoway. Excuse me, sir. Poetry put it in the door. He saw it into the bar. He, shot at, he poured a shot at Krabby's. He shouted, Slan Javar. Well, over in the corner, midnight was being a, shutted up by a midnight girl called Pam, who said, well, howdy, stranger, would you buy us a baby, Sean? <laughs> he drop ho, he drop hey, the tutor that come from side. Now, over in the corner, sat three men for the octor tool. They were playing games for money in a snakes and ladder school. <laughs> the third one was a southerner who'd come up from McMerry. He'd been a river gambler on the Balahoolish ferry. <laughs> he rum ho, he rum hey, the tutor that come the sky. Portray walked to the table and he shouted, shake me in. He shuggled on the air cup, he gave the dice a spin. He threw seven sixes in a row and the game was nearly done. But then he landed on a sneak and finished on square one. <laughs> the game was nearly over and Portray was dear fine. He'd landed on a ladder, he was up to 49. He only but put one to go and the other man to the other man was beat. But the gambler cut the board up and shouted, you're a cheat. <laughs> Men dive behind the rubber plants to try and save their skins. The accordionist stopped playing, his sidekicks dropped the spoons. He says, I think it's funny you've been up that ladder twice. And yeah, he was done at the table <laughs> when I go to throw my dice. He dropped my The gambler grabbed his ski and do as fast as lightning speed. The portrait grabbed a screw cop, he cracked him over the heat. 
Then Gil Wally, we are summoned off the wall and finished off the business with his lucky grouse boots claw. Poetry saunter to the bar, he says, I'll hear half. And you like the way I stuck it on that wee bit merry naff? But the southerner crept up behind, his features racked with pain, and gobbed him with an ashtray, made it a curling stain. <laughs> he drum ho, he drum hey, the chitter that come <coughs> for his The fight went raging all night till opening time next day. So this stop for stoop and stories of a coronation tree. It was kind of kind of obvious that neither man would win, but came the shout that stopped it all. There's a buster coming in. <laughs> he drum ho, he drum hey, the cheater that come free sky. They sing the song in Gala Shields and up by Peter Heat. Away down o'er the border, across the Rio Tweet. About what became a poetry midnight and the gambling man. They opened up a gift shop, selling fresh air in a can. He drum ho, he drum hey, the cheater that come free sky. Free sky. Your president first, please. You make that three dislike sense. Yes, three dislike sense. <laughs> so um, tonight uh, we are going to show our appreciation to um, two members of our club tonight. One who's not with us, Carolyn, who's laid up in the hospital and hopefully will join us at another date. And another is uh, Mitch. Mm. Yes. Mitch, so you have been a, a pillar of the Perth Speakers Club. You have seen, I, I don't actually know what you've done because I tried to look on the, the thing and I've seen that you've been um, president. president. I heard that you were secretary. You possibly joined before I was born, <laughs> but I'm not sure. I wasn't there. Um, 1982. Oh, right, so I was born. <laughs> Somebody told me it was in the 70s. Then, obviously, they forgot. So, so what actual roles have you been? So you, you've been president? I've been secretary? secretary, education director, social secretary. I wasn't treasurer. You weren't treasurer. You're not good for numbers. No, you were a civil servant. How can you be a civil servant and not be good for numbers? Just inch easy. Inches, inches. Anyway, so we would just like to thank you for being such a great guy and for for carrying on with the club um, for many years. So we need you a thing. I put it off this morning. I need you a certificate. Oh. Oh. Oh.